Committee, and Dr. John Williamson will help kick us off from uh, uh, N, uh, N NCCIH. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to be moderating this session. Uh, I'm very excited about this topic. Um, I'm going to move through it pretty quickly, but this is the therapeutic potential and pain and PTSD anxiety uh, session. Our first, and I'm co-moderating with Susan Borgia. I'll introduce the first two speakers, and Susan will introduce the second two. First two speakers, or the first speaker today is Andrea Hoffman from Indiana University. Uh, Andrea is a Linda and Jack Gill Chair of Biomedical Science and Professor of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University. Um, her work has focused on harnessing the therapeutic potential of the brain's own cannabis-like system to suppress pain uh, while minimizing the unwanted side effects. If you join me in welcoming Andrea. Also, I want to mention that I have no financial disclosures. Cannabis has been used for medicinal purposes to treat pain since the beginning of recorded history. I'd like to start my talk today by describing the results of a behavioral study using animals. When you administer formalin to the hind paw of a rat, it produces pain behavior. This slide quantifies pain behavior following formalin administration in the paw in control animals and in animals that received a dose of a cannabinoid known as WIN55212-2 or WIN2. Note that the effect of the cannabinoid is to dose-dependently suppress pain-related behavior, and at the high dose, pain behavior was virtually eliminated. But there's a problem with this interpretation. This is what a rat on WIN2 actually looks like. Now, the motor effects of cannabinoids, as we've heard from our previous speaker, are actually a very serious problem for behavioral studies, which largely rely upon assessing motor responses to noxious stimulation. So these types of studies alone aren't sufficient for, for us to conclude that cannabinoids suppress pain. To do that, it's really necessary to show that cannabinoids suppress nociceptive transmission. Now, Michael Walker's laboratory was the first to do this. Now, this slide summarizes some of the neural pathways that I'll be referring to. Notice that ascending pathways for the transmission of pain are shown in red, and descending pathways that serve to turn off or modulate pain are shown in blue. Now, pain is initiated when a subpopulation of neurons, the nociceptors, are activated by a noxious stimulus. And the nociceptors convey this information into pain processing regions in the spinal cord. Shown in red is the classical ascending pain pathway, the spinothalamic tract. Pain, however, is actively suppressed from descending projections that originate in the periaqueductal gray of the midbrain and the nucleus rapae magnus um, of the medulla, and these projections serve to turn off the transmission of impulses from nociceptors to the central nervous system. So an effect of a cannabinoid on the cells of the spinothalamic tract would provide a convincing argument that cannabinoids interrupt nociceptive transmission. We are recorded from wide dynamic range neurons in the lumbar spinal cord that code information about stimulus intensity. Here you can see the effects of the cannabinoid agonist WIN2, its inactive enantiomer WIN3, um, and the vehicle control. Note that the effect of the cannabinoid is suppressed is to suppress noxious stimulus-evoked neuronal activation, firing rate, in the wide dynamic range neurons. When we tested the effect of the high dose of the active compound on purely non-nociceptive neurons, no suppression was observed. So these observations are very important because they show that the effect of the cannabinoid was selected for the nociceptive neuron. Why dynamic range neurons were suppressed by the cannabinoid, but purely non-nociceptive neurons were unaffected under the same conditions. Well, I've shown you some behavioral data which suggests that cannabinoids suppress pain, and I've shown you some electrophysiological data which suggests that cannabinoids suppress pain processing. If these effects are mediated by a common mechanism, it should be possible to show a correspondence between them. 
So we compared the ability of cannabinoids to suppress pain behavior in a test of antinociception with their ability to suppress noxious stimuli-evoked firing rates and wide dynamic range neurons. So as you can see, as the dose of the cannabinoid is increased, firing rate in the VPL neurons is suppressed and antinociception is enhanced. So the strong correlation between the behavioral and the electrophysiological measures suggests that cannabinoids do indeed suppress nociceptive transmission. Now I want to emphasize that cannabinoids have been shown to produce antinociception in virtually every animal model of pathological pain that has been tested. I'd also like to emphasize that the evidence which suggests that cannabinoids suppress pain is not merely based on behavioral studies, but also includes the results of neurochemical studies and neurophysiological studies. And that from these studies, we can conclude that both CB1 and CB2 receptor mechanisms suppress pain. Now, the studies using synthetic cannabinoids suggest that endocannabinoids suppress pain under physiological conditions. We've already heard a lot to, at this meeting about these two endocannabinoids, enantamide and 2-AG, which are the best studied of the endocannabinoids isolated so far. Enantamide is hydrolyzed by this enzyme, fatty acid amide hydrolase, into breakdown products, arachidonic acid and ethanolamine. And indeed, FON inhibitors that are both brain penetrant and brain impenetrant have been developed and are an exciting possible target for drug development in industry. These FON inhibitors suppress pain primarily through CB1 mechanisms. Now, the mechanisms that are responsible for the formation of endo, uh, the endocannabinoid and andamide do remain incompletely understood. But by contrast, we know that 2-AG is produced on demand and acts as a retrograde endocannabinoid messenger to suppress pain, at least at the level of the periaqueductal gray. So in the periaqueductal gray, activation of metabotropic glutamate receptors by glutamate triggers the consecutive activation of two enzymes, phospholipase C-beta and diacylglycerol lipase alpha. This results in the formation of 2-AG in the postsynaptic neuron. Following its formation, 2-AG would then be released to engage presynaptic CB1 receptors. And as we heard yesterday, the net result of binding to CB1 is to turn off the release of the excitatory neurotransmitter from that presynaptic terminal. Now, following binding to CB1 receptors, um, 2-AG would then be deactivated, first by transport into cells, then by intracellular hydrolysis, which is catalyzed by a distinct enzyme, monoacylglycerol lipase. Now, multiple inhibitors of monoacylglycerol lipase have also been described, and they produce antinociception, primarily through CB1 and CB2-specific mechanisms. But I'd like to emphasize that these endocannabinoid deactivation inhibitors lack many of the untoward motor side effects associated with direct agonists, such as WIN2 or THC. So much of the research in the field has really focused on these two enzymes, FA and monoacylglycerol lipase, which degrade the endocannabinoids. However, it's very important to keep in mind that these enzymes are actually not selective for endocannabinoids. They degrade other lipids that do not actually bind to cannabinoid receptors. Moreover, it's probably also very important to keep in mind that in vivo, um, the enzymes that control the metabolism of endocannabinoids might not look very much like this at all, but they're probably much more likely to look like this. Now, this poses actually a considerable challenge for drug development efforts, because we still need to know more about the conditions under which some of these other metabolic enzymes would be activated and engaged, and what the functional roles of some of these products of endocannabinoid metabolism really is. Now, CB1 receptor activation has many desirable therapeutic properties, including suppression of pain. The problem is that activation of these receptors also produces unwanted psychoactive effects and side effects that are undesirable in a therapeutic intervention. So the classical marijuana high. Thank you, Miles. 
Now, these observations have really prompted research efforts that were focused on separating therapeutic efficacy from unwanted CNS side effects. Now, one way this has been done in the pain field has been to target peripheral cannabinoid mechanisms that bypass the central nervous system or bypass CB1 receptors within the central nervous system. But I also want to emphasize that CB2 receptors are found primarily in immune tissues and immune cells, only at low levels in the CNS, but they may be induced in response to inflammation and injury. And so much research efforts have focused on harnessing the therapeutic potential of CB2 receptors for suppressing pain. Now I'm going to use this molecule, CB55940, because it binds with equal affinity to both CB1 and CB2 receptors. And I'm going to use this to really reveal the functional roles of CB1 and CB2 in suppressing pain. Now in all of the studies that I'm presenting here today, we're going to use animals that are in a neuropathic pain state to better increase translational relevance because we're not just interested in efficacy, we're also interested in side effects and we're also interested in abuse liability. So in these studies, we used a model of neuropathic pain that was produced by injection of the chemotherapeutic agent paclitaxel. So notice that the effect of the chemotherapy is to produce a time-dependent lowering of the threshold for paw withdrawal to mechanical stimulation, which is the consistent with the development of a mechanical allodynia or hypersensitivity to pain. Now, if you give CP55940 to um, neuropathic animals that have received paclitaxel, you see unwanted side effects, or actually CB1-mediated pharmacological effects that are not desirable for a therapeutic intervention. Shown here, you can see that CP55940 produces a dose-dependent hypothermic effect. It also can produce motor impairment at higher doses. And these effects are CB1-mediated. Note that they're absent in the CB1 receptor knockout mouse. But fortunately, I'm going to tell you that with repeated administration, tolerance develops to these unwanted hypothermic effects of the cannabinoid. Unfortunately, I'm also going to tell you that tolerance developed to the therapeutic effects of this cannabinoid agonist. So notice CB55940 at a dose that engages CB1 receptors um, produced um, therapeutic efficacy and attenuated paclitaxel-induced neuropathic pain. But with repeated dosing, the cannabinoid no longer produced therapeutic efficacy. Again, the antiallergenic effect was mediated by CB1 receptors because it was absent in the CB1 receptor knockout mice. Well, what about the potential for abuse liability? We address this question by taking our neuropathic animals that received chronic dosing with cannabinoids and then challenging them with a CB1 antagonist in an effort to precipitate a withdrawal syndrome. Notice that in animals that were chronically treated with the cannabinoid, shown here as CP55940, but we've seen the same results with THC, um, notice that we can unmask a withdrawal syndrome by challenging the animals with the CB1 antagonist. And this is, um, appears here as increases in paw tremors, head shakes, and scratching bouts. Notice that it's CB1 mediated because this pattern of behavior is absent in CB1 receptor knockout mice. Well, these studies suggest that activation of CB1 receptors has desirable therapeutic properties, including producing antinociception and suppressing neuropathic pain. But especially at higher doses, we also see hypothermia, motor impairment, and physical dependence. So we asked whether under conditions in which um, binding to cannabinoid CB1 receptors was eliminated, whether we could unmask CB2-mediated antinociceptive effects that were free of these unwanted pharmacological effects associated with CB1 receptors in the brain. So we did this using CB1 receptor knockout mice. Then we gave them the very same compound, CP55940, but at a higher dose to engage the CB2 receptors. So under these conditions, I want to emphasize that using CB1 receptor knockout mice, the very same compound produces sustained therapeutic efficacy through a CB2 receptor mechanism. Note that this effect could be completely blocked by a CB2 antagonist, AM630, and that with sustained dosing, and we've done this in rodents for up to four weeks, 
We've seen no um, tolerance with repeated dosing via CB2 receptor mechanism. So these studies suggest that activation of CB2 receptors would be an exciting therapeutic target for drug development um, in industry for putative analgesics, particularly for neuropathic and inflammatory pain. And so we collaborated with the laboratory of Alex Macrianis to address this question using selective CB2 agonists to produce a suppression of a neuropathic pain state. Notice that the compound AM1710 was able to basically completely reverse neuropathic pain in our animal model. And it did this again with sustained efficacy, with no tolerance, and with no signs of CB1 receptor activation, like hypothermia or motor impairment, or even physical dependence or tolerance. Notice also that the effects of the CB2 agonists were mediated by CB2 receptors because all of the efficacy disappeared in the CB2 receptor knockout mice. So um, we, we know that paclitaxel produces neuropathic pain, at least in part, by activating pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines in the central nervous system. So our studies and those of others in the literature suggest that activation of CB2 receptors can suppress pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, thereby blunting neuropathic pain. And it can do this without producing hypothermia, motor impairment, physical dependence, or tolerance. Now, by contrast, THC, the orthosteric classical cannabinoid agonist, also suppresses neuropathic pain. But because it engages CB1 receptors in the CNS, it also produced hypothermia, motor impairment, physical dependence, and tolerance, effects that would be undesirable for a therapeutic intervention. So does this mean that CB1 receptors have no therapeutic potential for suppressing pain? Clearly, my view is that answer is no. We've already heard earlier in this meeting about the existence of an allosteric binding site on the G protein coupled cannabinoid receptor. Can Mackey describe to us how binding of a positive allosteric modulator to this site has the result of increasing the affinity or the efficacy of the endogenous cannabinoid at that classical orthosteric binding site? So the net result of having the presence of that CB1 positive allosteric net modulator on board is that we get boosted signaling downstream of binding to the G protein coupled receptor. Moreover, we are also preserving the spatial and temporal pattern of endocannabinoid signaling in contrast to flooding this whole system with a systemic administration of a global CB1 agonist. So here we compared the classical orthosteric cannabinoid agonist delta 9 THC with a CB1 positive allosteric modulator under identical conditions. Notice that THC initially suppresses neuropathic pain in our animal models, but with repeated dosing, we see complete tolerance developing to the therapeutic effects of THC. Notice also that tolerance develops much more rapidly to the high compared to the lower dose of THC. By contrast, work in Aaron Lichtman's laboratory and our own laboratories has suggested that CB1 positive allosteric modulators show sustained efficacy that is not subject to tolerance. Moreover, they also lack the unwanted effects of cannabinoids on motor activity and hypothermia. Well, these studies using Delta 9 THC um, make us really think about what are the implications for use of cannabis and use of cannabinoid-based therapeutic interventions. But I want to emphasize that cannabis is not the same as Delta 9 THC. We already heard at this meeting that cannabis contains about 400 active compounds. Many of them may have therapeutic benefit. And one of the compounds that we heard quite a lot about to, um, at this meeting yesterday was cannabidiol. Work by Sarah Jane Ward has examined the efficacy of cannabidiol in suppressing neuropathic pain in the same animal model that I've presented here today. Note that cannabidiol shows sustained therapeutic efficacy without tolerance, and this was observed over 21 days of repeated dosing. So these findings taken together should really suggest that perhaps if we combine THC with cannabidiol, we'll see a better therapeutic effect without tolerance. 
So we've tested this in humans by collaborating with the laboratory of Mary Lynch to examine the effects of Sativex on chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathic pain. This was done in a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial. This was a pilot trial with Sativex, which is an oral mucosal spray which contains THC and cannabidiol in a one-to-one -one ratio. So half the patients obtained Sativex followed by placebo, and the other half obtained placebo followed by Sativex. The primary outcome measure was the numerical rating scale of pain intensity with anchors of zero, no pain, and 10 being as bad as you can imagine. So the results of this pilot study in the population of subjects evaluated as a whole can be shown here. There was no effect of Sativex compared to the placebo group. So what does this mean? Are we somehow lost in translation and there's a problem with translating the results from our preclinical studies in animals where these same compounds have shown therapeutic efficacy and moving them to the clinic? Well, I would argue that that answer is actually probably no and that our animal models, I believe, are actually pretty good. Even within the same study, a responder analysis was able to detect a subset of patients that showed significant benefit of Sativex compared to the placebo arm of the same subjects. And this was with the numbers needed to treat that was approximately the same as gabapentin. So I'd also like to emphasize that if we compare the results of this pilot trial with what we see with published randomized controlled trials of cannabinoids in pain that I've recently reviewed with um, Ethan Russo, I'd like to call your attention not to the individual studies, but to the overwhelming amount of green on the slide. The shaded green cells show the clinical trials in which cannabinoids have shown efficacy for pain. The white cells show the trials in which um, the cannabinoid did not show efficacy, so it's not very good for postoperative pain. And the gray cell shows a um, study in which the cannabinoids did not improve pain, but they improved other parameters such as sleep, which are therapeutically useful. So where do we go from here? I think I'll conclude my talk now by summarizing a little bit about what we think we know. Um, we know that cannabinoids suppress pain processing through CB1 and CB2-specific mechanisms. They do this through spinal, supraspinal, and peripheral mechanisms. And this conclusion is largely supported by behavioral, neurochemical, and neurophysiological studies. We know that cannabinoid CB2 mechanisms and potentially peripheral cannabinoid mechanisms may bypass unwanted centrally mediated side effects of global cannabinoid agonists. We also know that endocannabinoids suppress pain. Moreover, pain modulates the endocannabinoid system. 2-AG is a retrograde endocannabinoid messenger that is produced on demand to produce adaptive changes in pain responsiveness. We know that enzymes implicated in endocannabinoid deactivation remain exciting therapeutic targets. Allosteric modulators of CB1 signaling also suppress pain in preclinical studies, and cannabidiol, a phytocannabinoid, shows therapeutic potential. Moreover, the results of randomized control trials largely support efficacy of cannabinoids for suppressing neuropathic pain, also, although some adverse effects are also observed. What we still need to know, originally I had four slides for this, but I've tried to reduce it to one because um, I'm, I'm over time. I apologize to you all for that. Uh, we still need to know the best way to separate therapeutic efficacy of cannabinoids from unwanted side effects, and I've talked about a couple of approaches that we um, can take to consider that possibility. We also need to know what the signaling pathways are that are responsible for efficacy or unwanted pharmacological effects of cannabinoids. This may also help us understand why some cannabinoids might fail in clinical trials if they're not signaling through the right signal transduction pathways. We do need to know more about the therapeutic potential of brain permeant versus impermeant inhibitors of endocannabinoid deactivation, whether they produce um, desensitization or unwanted side effects. We still need to know the mechanism of action of cannabidiol. 
and so we can better understand its therapeutic potential. We need to know if CB1 PAMs will have superior therapeutic profiles compared to other cannabinoid-based therapeutics, and we need to improve translation of preclinical findings to clinical populations. We don't know what are the factors that um, distinguish responders from non-responders in clinical trials, whether it's differences in efficacy or unwanted side effects or even genetics. And I think that we, we should make an effort to better understand comorbid disease states, because right now, the patients that may receive the most benefit from cannabinoid-based therapeutics might be patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and chronic pain, but such patients would actually be excluded from clinical trials focused on a unitary dimension. And so now I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and thank you very much for your attention. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Barth White Wilsey, um, who is an associate uh, physician at, in the departments of psychiatry and anesthesiology at the University of California, San Diego. Um, Dr. Wellesley is going to hopefully uh, talk about his two published um, papers out of a number of manuscripts on clinical trials involving human laboratory experiences that have demonstrated the efficacy of smoked and vaporized cannabis in the treatment of neuropathic pain. Um, join me in welcoming 